thank you guys for for going some sleep coming here for uh i hope it'll be a blessing of an equipping hour i know that the study of the topic of sleep biblically has been a blessing for me um I anticipate that this will be a four-part series. This is part three of that series. The other two you can get uh, online, um, on our website, on YouTube. And today I, I want to continue our thinking about the topic of sleep and particularly how a Christian sleep should be different than that of a non-Christian. I want you to ask yourself, How ought your sleep to be different than a Mormon, a Buddhist, an atheist, an agnostic, or your culturally but not born-again Christian neighbor? And today, considering the topic of how sleep is a gift from God, I hope that we will inform our view of sleep and be able to sleep differently than those who do not know God. So in the next few weeks, we'll be considering how sleep can be used as an opportunity to glorify God, but also an opportunity to sin. All of humanity must sleep, right? We are all capable of sinning in relation to our sleep. We can learn about good and poor sleep practices, sleep hygiene from believer and non-believer alike. But only Christians are truly able to glorify God the God who made sleep and made us to sleep as we sleep. So we're going to continue our review of the Bible's teachings on the topic of sleep in order to first and most understand what the one who created sleep says about sleep. If you were here for the first two sessions, I passed out a passage list, which was my intent, my Um, efforts to summarize all of the Bible's verses on sleep. I've added some more to my own own study. Rather than printing out a ton to give you guys the same paper you might already have, if you want that, please just text me or email me and I can send that to you. But let's go back and review part one of our series where you can Um, where we learned that sleep is a small and very real act of faith. It's a necessity for all of us, but it's also an opportunity to humbly and dependently trust God as we find ourselves unconscious, helpless, asleep. Sleep must be a nightly reminder that God is God and we are not. Every creature that God has made sleeps. And God never sleeps. He doesn't slumber. We spend a long time sleeping about or learning about that, that without sleep, we get sicker, weaker, die earlier. And God, but God does not rest because he doesn't need to. He made us to sleep. And he is the only one who does not sleep. We are not God And it ultimately doesn't matter whether we want to sleep or not, that no matter how hard you try to stay awake, you and I will grow weary. We will tire and sleep will win. We learned that we can last longer without water than we can without sleep. And like it or not, you you will ultimately be rendered unconscious, helpless, and vulnerable. And God designed it this way. Right? So God will never grow weary. He will never faint. So for this reason, we learned, and this was the first point that we learned in week one, that sleep should be a nightly humbling reminder that God is God and we are creatures. Every time in scripture that God proclaims the fact that he does not sleep, it's paired in the near context with instruction that his people ought to find their strength in him through dependent, trusting faith. If the the slides are there, if not, I I got them to the PowerPoint people late. Not up? All right, sorry. I do have the summary points. So Um, we then went to Psalm 121, two through three. So the first point was that sleep should be a nightly humbling reminder that God is God and we are creatures. And in light of that, 
Um, Psalm 121, 2 through 3 says, My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep, slumber nor sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. So based on this confidence, David proclaimed while Absalom his son, and his son's army sought his life, he said in Psalm 3, 5 through 6, he said, I lay down and slept. I woke again for you alone, O Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. So the first point that we learned in week one was that sleep should be a nightly humbling reminder that God is God and we are creatures. And number two, from that comes the point that sleep is a nightly demonstration of our need and God's incomparable faithfulness, power, and strength. And because of that, sleep is a nightly opportunity to humbly, independently trust God. We're going to build on that foundation today and go to Psalm 127, verses 1 through 2. That's where we're going to start. That's where we finished last time, and that's where we're going to start this time. Psalm 127, 1 through 2. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV. There's an important uh, interpret. There's an important translation difference at the end of, of verse two, which is why I'm doing that. It's the way that the Septuagint translated the verse. I think both are probably valid options. I'm going to go with the ESV um, just so that you're not thrown off if you're reading from NAS. Um, Psalm 127, 1 through 2 says, Unless Yahweh builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And unless Yahweh watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Sleep is a gift from God. These verses clearly teach that there are only two types of activity that mankind can participate in. Look at it carefully. There's only two types of activity. And this, this is just as true now as it was thousands of years ago. The two types of activity are that which God accomplishes through us and vain, worthless activity. There's no other alternatives. This is just as true for the Jewish pilgrims who sang the song, Climbing the Mountain to Jerusalem, as it is now. There are only two types of activity, two possible classifications of what, you, of what you do while you're awake. No alternatives, no third category. It's that which God does through us and then vain, worthless, futile, inconsequential activity. Unless Yahweh builds the house, those who build it labor in vain, and unless Yahweh watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Those who think that the security of their city depends ultimately on them are watching in vain, right? This kind of person will cut their night of sleep short, waking early, staying up late in order to ensure that their needs are met by them. There is no thought to ask God for provision or protection or if they do, it's an afterthought, not the foundation of their hope. So much of the sleep that one engaging in this kind of labor of futility does get will likely be spent worrying about that which they cannot control. Likewise, the nature of maybe your lack of sleep, not all lack of sleep is sinful lack of sleep. We're going to spend a significant amount of time on that next week. But if you find your sleep plagued by anxiety, worrying about what's coming tomorrow, worrying about the things that you cannot control, viewing sleep 
is an unpleasant interruption in all that you have to do, this may be an indicator that you are working apart from the Lord and um, not ultimately relying on him for both the, the strength to accomplish the tasks and um, his, his wisdom guiding which tasks you ought to be about. God doesn't say that the kind of sleepless toil described in Psalm 127 won't ever be successful, right? If you get up early, if you stay up late, and you work weekends, you may be able to make more money. You might be more successful in your job, in your business. If you cram extra hours into the day, you'll likely accomplish more. We're going to learn, we'll go into later why that might not be true, why God has uh, established sleep to naturally limit our ability to just accomplish more by our own efforts of, of will. But when you accomplish more, what will you be accomplishing more of? Vanity, worthless things, the things that will not survive. Ecclesiastes 2, 22 through 23, up on the screen, it says, What has a man from all the toil and strivings of heart with which he toils under the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow. His work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. The man who is about toiling after vain things, even in that, he doesn't get to enjoy the kind of rest that the one who receives the gift of sleep from God enjoys. And in Ecclesiastes 8, 16 through 17, the same author says, when I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out, even though a wise man claims to know he cannot find it out. It is in vain that you rise early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Work apart from God will always and only be ultimately in vain. And then in light of this apart from God vanity, Psalm 127 draws out the most unexpected conclusion. It says, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Sleep is a gift from God. Sleep is a gift of God for his beloved. In one of the greatest contrasts between those who know and trust God and those who do not ought to be their sleep. We spent the first two sessions learning of God's incomprehensible wise, loving, sovereign, omnipotent, creating and sustaining power. Nothing in the universe exists or occurs apart from him, and only for those whom he loves and is predestined for adoption as sons, for those whom he has called according to his purpose, does God irrevocably promise that he works all things together for good. For that beloved one, sleep is sweet. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the Christian will sleep more, will necessarily have better sleep cycles, right? There's things outside of your control. It might be noisy neighbor, mom with new babies, new kids, illness, back pain, really good tasks that you ought to be about for a season. There are reasons why the Christian might sleep less, might not have as good of quality of sleep, but only the Christian can receive sleep as a gift from God and express a trust in God working all things together for good while they sleep. Solomon, who wrote this psalm, 
also wrote Proverbs 3.24. He speaks of the one who finds the wisdom rooted in trust and fear in Yahweh and describes that one's sleep. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. For Yahweh will be your confidence. God's beloved can enjoy the gift of sweet sleep, resting comfortably because they know that God is working all things together for their good. And they know the one from whom this gift of sleep comes. But note in Psalm 127 that this gift of sleep is reserved in a special way, right? All people sleep, but it's reserved in a special way for God's beloved for the one who fears him, who trusts him. The sleep of the one who trusts is sweet, knowing that even while we sleep, God is working. John Piper says it well. He says, God is working for us around the clock. He does not take days off. He does not sleep. In fact, he is so eager to work for us that he goes around looking for more work to do for people who will trust in him. The eyes of Yahweh run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Second Chronicles 16, 9. God loves to show his tireless power in wisdom and goodness by working for people who trust him. Jesus himself is the clearest revelation of this truth. The son of man came not to serve, came not to be served, but to serve. And in so doing, he gave his life as a ransom for many. I want to just take some time to look at the verse that he referenced here, Second Chronicles 16, 7 through 9, in its entirety, and consider it in light of Psalm 127. So the context of this passage, Second Chronicles 16, 7 through 9, this is toward the end of King Asa's reign. He started his reign trusting in Yahweh. He started well, and Yahweh saved him in those early days from armies that outnumbered his own more than three to one, right? Consider this, Psalm 127 starts with the watchman keeping watch in vain unless the Lord watches. And this was evidence that the Lord does watch for his people. And God attributed the success of Asa against the armies of Ethiopia and Libya to God's own work. Asa led Israel well to trust Yahweh. He destroyed idols, and then God worked for him to bring safety and protection to the nation. Second uh, Chronicles fifteen nineteen says, and there was no more war until the 35th year of his reign. But now, despite the good start, Asa's heart has wandered. In chapter 16, Basha, king of Israel, decided to set siege against Judah. And instead of praying and trusting Yahweh, Asa trusted in his own power and his own might and his own relationships. You have a map up on the screen to sort of show the situation. You have Israel up in orange on the top. You have Asa and Judah down on the bottom, Jerusalem right there on the border. And Basha had set siege to the city. Um, And first and most, um, he schemed. The king Asa schemed and looked for his own resources and sent money uh, to Ben-Hadad, king of uh, Syria, and successfully bribed him into attacking Israel's northern flank up on the top. So from Damascus, come down. Now you have a two two-sided war, and it was successful. Israel had to pull away from the siege and go take care of business in the north. Um, So it it would seem like King Asa did something right. He 
successfully guarded Israel or Judah from the threat. He was shrewd and he used his physical resources at his disposal to protect his city. Nothing wrong with that, right? That is something that's wise, that's prudent, that is good use of resources, but he is not commended for this because the problem was that he relied on those physical resources. And in so doing, he did not rely on Yahweh, the one who had already proven himself in protecting Asa against a million-man army of Ethiopia. So don't misunderstand me or the Bible here. The problem is not that Asa worked to protect Judah. The problem is that he did so apart from reliance on God, instead of relying on the power, riches, and relationships that he had amassed. And God had proven himself so clearly in his power and his protection and provision for that king, that it would have been right and natural for him to say, God, just as you protected me over the last 35 years, helping me conquer a million man army from Syria, amazing. God, will you protect me now? And then praying and using the resources that God had provided, maybe he would have sought the help of Damascus. Maybe he wouldn't have. But he forewent, he didn't even think, God is my provision. God is my protection. He went about trying to protect his city on his own. And God proved that that would be in vain. Brothers and sisters, we have so much more evidence of God's being for us and protecting us than King Asa ever did. When you face a problem, when I face a problem, my sleep, I'm back to the topic of sleep, my sleep is naturally challenged. Yours might be too. If you're waiting on a medical diagnosis that you're going to have to get in a few days, staying awake does not help you there. And even if there was something that you could do that night, if you go there first, if you find yourself searching Google, for answers to your questions before you fall on your knees and ask God for his provision. I want you to think about the implications of these passages and what that might mean on the, whether your efforts are in vain or not. If you find yourself losing a job or in financial difficulties and you say, if God would not spare his son, will he not give us all things? Uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things, the things that you need will be added to you. He won't, he, he won't let a bird fall to the ground without his noticing. He closed the grass of the field. And if you're his child, he predestined you for adoption as sons before the foundation of the world at the cost of his son. He will take care of you. It doesn't mean that you don't work. It doesn't mean that you don't use the resources that he's given. We must not rely on those resources in the way that we sleep or the way that we forego sleep speaks volumes to who, in whom we are trusting. So back to the verse, Second Chronicles 16, 7 through 9. God says, because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on Yahweh your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on Yahweh, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of Yahweh run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. God was just waiting for Asa to say, help me. And instead, he says, you have done foolishly in this, and from now on you will have wars. King Asa's watching his late nights, his early morning were in vain because it was him watching the city instead of Yahweh. So compare Asa's self-dependence to the response of King of Judah's King Hezekiah, just a few generations later, 
whose reign was de- characterized by dependence on Yahweh and repentance from that sin when he didn't. Hezekiah found Jerusalem surrounded by a powerful army of, army of Sennacherib of Assyria. The Rabshakeh of Assyria mocked Hezekiah's reliance on Yahweh, 2 Kings 18 through 22. If you're not familiar with this story, you have to read it. It is awesome. We're, I wish I could go through the whole thing, but I think I've veered far enough from sleep that we'll just summarize this. Hezekiah's response, he's facing an army, huge army surrounding a city, and things look hopeless. Hezekiah's response was one was not one first of looking to his own resources. Hezekiah had an army, not a very strong one, and he had people who were keeping watch, ensuring that the city was strong. But in the face of being surrounded, his response was not characterized first and most by self-reliance or anxiety or counting how many chariots and horses and swords and measuring the odds. His, reliant, or his first response was prayer. 2 Kings 19.15, And Hezekiah prayed before Yahweh and said, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms and of the earth, and you have made heaven and earth. So now, O Yahweh, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Yahweh, are God alone. And then while Hezekiah and the people were asleep, God worked. 2 Kings 19.35, and that night, the angel of Yahweh went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. God does not sleep, so we can receive the gift of sleep, knowing that it is he who protects us. God is awake all day and all night looking for opportunities to work for his beloved who trust him. For he gives to his beloved sleep. And as the NASB translates this verse, he even gives to his beloved in their sleep. So don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand the scriptures. The Christian's life should not be dominated by sleep. We're going to cover this later. If you're in a battle, a fight, if your job is to be a, if you're in a battle fight, if your job is to be a watchman, watch. If you have a house to build, build it. And if you have work to do, do it, but do it in a way that relies not on yourself and your fighting, your watching, your building, but that relies on God who works through you. The quality, the sweetness of your sleep will be a good barometer of how well you do this. So as we work hard, may Psalm 20 verse 7 be our anthem. It says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of Yahweh our God. And if our trust while we are awake is Yahweh, then we will sleep well as God works for us while we enjoy his gift of sleep. If we were trusting in ourselves, our proverbial chariots and horses while awake, we likely won't sleep well and our self-dependent labors will be in vain. This verse, it's Psalm 20, verse 7, uh, in the midst of my own cancer struggles and those of my son have, have brought me many nights of sleep. My We all have the, uh, I guess, our mixed condition, indwelling sin that's still present. Uh, I can respond to trials and act like I'm trusting God by just putting the difficulty out of mind. Man, I am facing, a. don't know if you've done this, I'm facing a really big struggle, a really big battle, rather than facing that battle head on and just say, wow, this doesn't look good. God, will you protect me? God, will you provide? God, I I don't know how this is going to work out, but I know you know and I trust you. Rather than 
going there, I might have a tendency to just put it out of mind and act like that's trusting God, deal with anxiety rather than letting my request be made known to God with thanksgiving and then relying on the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I might fight anxiety by just pretending the problem isn't there. This verse was a, a correction to me or a help to me in that. Pray it would be to you. You might say, how? All right, well, in particular with cancer, we're faced, if you're, or any problem, you're faced with decisions you have to make. And so I've used this as shorthand. You'll probably get it if you talk to me about struggles. I'm like, when we go into a struggle, I, if we go into a battle, I want to go with the fastest horses, the strongest chariots, the sharpest swords. That's not wrong. But as you, in, so if you're facing something like cancer or a important decision to make, you can do your research in order to go with the best efforts, right? The best um, medicine, the strongest horses, the, the best chariots. But you do that in such a way as when you win the battle, God gets the glory, right? The, it's a heart thing. It might look the same to somebody on the outside, but God knows the heart and he is looking to help those who trust him, who rely on him. And so if your trust is Yahweh, that might not actually change what you do versus somebody whose trust isn't Yahweh. You might choose the exact same treatment. You might choose a certain job if you have opportunities in front of you. You might respond to financial difficulty or danger in the same way. But what will be different will be your sleep. One of you will be able to sleep sweet, hard, knowing that it's God who's going to work for you while you sleep because your reliance was never on yourself. And the other sleep will be plagued with anxiety saying, man, this is all about me. I have to get this figured out. And if I turn my brain off for even a few minutes, what's going to happen? The difference might not be in the activity, but it will be reflected in the sleep. So I want to continue for a bit on the consideration of sleep being a gift from God. We've learned how sleep is a special gift given by God for his beloved, a confident rest from labor rooted in trust in the God who works for us while we're asleep. That's just going to be the quality of sleep, the sweetness of sleep, and what your sleep reflects. For the non-believer, sleep will merely reflect exhaustion and a physiologic need for sleep. For the believer, it is that, but it's more than that. It is a trust in God. It's an expression of trust in God, a reminder that you are not God, and a uh, very real act of faith each night. But sleep is also a gift of common grace, even for those whose labors are in vain, even for God's enemies. It's a kindness of the Lord that even his enemies benefit from. How much more his children who can give thanks to him, knowing that every time we get a chance to sleep, it's a gift from God. Just as the sun rises every morning on the just and the unjust, Matthew 5, 45, and just like food, water, air, and so many good things that we all get from God, God is the giver of those good things. Sleep is a gift of God that countless people receive, but are oblivious to the gracious, loving source of those things. Christian, don't take common graces for granted, but give God thanks for these gifts, and the, especially the gift of sleep. Just like we ought not eat a meal without giving thanks to God for its provision, so too we ought not go to sleep or wake up without giving thanks to God. Charles Spurgeon eloquently preached in an excellent sermon on this passage. He said, oh, my friends, how thankful we should be for sleep. Sleep is the best physician that I know of. Sleep hath healed more pains of wearied bones than the most eminent physicians upon earth. It is the best medicine 
the choicest thing of all the names that are written in all the lists of pharmacy. There is nothing like to sleep. What a mercy it is that it belongs alike to all. God does not make sleep the boon of the rich man. He does not give it merely to the noble or the rich so that they can keep it as a peculiar, peculiar luxury for themselves, but he bestows it upon all. If there be a difference, the sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. He who toils sleeps all the sounder for his toil. But as it is the gift of God, it is a gift most precious, one that cannot be valued until it is taken away. And even then, we cannot appreciate it as we ought. Spurgeon calls sleep the best medicine. And he's on to something here. The scientists, uh, that scientists since his day are only now beginning to gain an understanding of, and I, I think we've just begun to crack the surface. Imagine for a moment what you would pay for a drug that did what sleep did. A drug that has that works as advertised and has no negative side effects when taken as directed. It's a medicine that makes you feel better, refreshes you. You'll have more energy. You'll need to eat less. It makes you live longer, ward off Alzheimer's and dementia. It improves memory, reflexes, and skill in almost all tasks. It enhances creativity and logical reasoning. It decreases stress levels relieves symptoms of depression, it protects from cancer, colds, and coronavirus, it will dramatically decrease your chance of heart attack and stroke. And if you do have a stroke, it will help you recover better than any treatment we know of. It wards off chronic disease like diabetes, it will help you lose weight, burning fat, and gaining muscle, it will make you faster, stronger, smarter, and generally better at all that you do. That is not hyperbole. That's not an overstatement. Each one of those statements have been demonstrated uh, by pretty rigorous research to be true. Imagine what you would do, what you would pay for such a drug. And how just like God is it to give us that gift that is received best when we despair of ourselves and trust in him, right? Think of his other well, the best gift of salvation. How is that to be received? Through faith. If you are relying on yourself, you actually render yourself incapable of receiving the gift of God as himself, or the gift that God gives us to himself, reconciliation, adoption of sons, forgiveness of sins, all through the blood of Jesus. That only comes by faith. Sleep, all get some of the benefits of. But it's when we rely on ourselves that we tend to neglect this gift of sleep. It's sort of ironic humor and just like God to create a gift of sleep that works like this. And I want sleep is so much more than mere unconsciousness. While we sleep, our bodies are busy doing things that don't happen while we're awake. Your mental aptitude and physical vitality can't be what they can be, what they otherwise would be apart from a night's sleep. It's often that, that we can think that we can accomplish more better by cutting a night's sleep short, neglecting sleep by staying up late, getting up early. But God has designed this gift to be one that we need. And if we neglect this gift, if we cut the night short thinking that we can get a little on the front end, a little off the back end, and actually be better. You're setting yourself up for chronic performance impairments, illnesses, and a shorter life. If you want to be able to serve God better, which ought to be all of our goals with each day that we have on this earth, God, I want to be able to maximize my effectiveness for you. And eating right, exercising, filling your mind with good things while you are awake. So helpful, especially just daily disciplines in those arenas are going to make you more and more fruitful as you get old. I don't think 
I mean, apart from daily Bible reading and just the spiritual disciplines, I don't think that there is a physical discipline that's going to be as effective towards long-term fruitfulness in the faith than sleep. I, I don't say that lightly. I just isn't. One night's loss of sleep will affect you far more than poor eating, far more than lack of physical exercise. And you stack that up and then the negative benefits stack. So I want us to resolve to embrace sleep as a gift. Sleep is a nightly opportunity to humbly, dependently trust God and receive these amazing physical benefits that he graciously bestows on those who sleep. So let's resolve to embrace and not neglect sleep. The same God that will provide for you as you work is the God who designed you to need sleep every night, to physiologically need about eight hours of sleep. That varies throughout life. When you're young, it's more. As you age, it's less. But it's probably more than our culture has adapted you to think. It's not six. So it, it varies. When you're a teenager, it easily can be 10. As you get old, midlife, it's generally, for most people, about eight. Um, it can be less as you age. Everybody's different. But God designed you to need that to operate, to function um, optimally. And for the discerning Christian, we recognize that he didn't do this to take away our opportunity to work. It isn't an unfortunate uh, byproduct in our design. It's actually designed for us as an opportunity to make you rest and rely on him to work for us. And he is the one who ordained the good works of your life and each of your days. So if you or I find ourselves constantly rising early and going to bed late, it's likely a sign that much of the bread that we're eating is that of anxious toil rather than that that comes from steadfast trust in God. So sleep is a good gift of God. Only Christians can work knowing that God is the one behind the scenes keeping that work from being in vain. Only Christians can fully receive the gift of sleep as intended for God's beloved, because it's only for his beloved that God will work for them as they sleep. Anxious toiling will ultimately be powerless to provide for you, and it certainly won't provide for your eternity. Anxiety is a sin, and an attempt to wrest control of the universe and provision from, your, from yourself, from the God who knows what you need, orders your steps, and provides in loving wisdom just what is right. And what's so sweet is that while we sleep, while we resign ourselves to do nothing, God works and God uses this gift of sleep to renew your body, to allow you to work better, more diligently, and more, successful, more successfully with better skill while you actually do work. So you might find yourself being more productive in the 16 hours that God gives you to work um, when you sleep as much as God designed you to sleep than you will be when you try to rest control. And so let's spend just a little time. You guys, people ask me to do this, just talk about physiology of sleep. That's not the purpose of this. But when we're th considering the gift of God, just common grace gift of God of sleep, it's just incredible to consider that it's so much more than unconsciousness. Um, through medications, we, we can render, I can render one of you unconscious to the point where you can't discern from the outside a difference between that state of anesthesia or sedation and sleep. But if we were to stick electrodes on your head, it would look incredibly different. And one would give minimal to no benefits of sleep, muscle relaxation, some of those things, some of it transitions into sleep, but you minimize and even lose almost all the benefits of sleep when you're sedated compared to when you sleep. It's crazy when you think about these stages that God orchestrated that all of us go through every single night. We just take it for granted. Okay, I fall asleep, I wake up in the morning. And when you think of what God designed to be happening, that you don't even have to participate in, it's amazing. So there's 
a few the, different ways to think about the stages of sleep. There is just grossly REM and non-REM. So REM is the rapid eye movement sleep. Your eyes move rapidly when you're in that stage. And then there's four stages of non-REM sleep. It could be called like stage one, two, light, stage three, four, deep. Some different things happen. But in each of these stages, especially in the non-REM, your brain is doing something it doesn't do while you're awake. While you're awake, your brain, your, if you were to put electrodes on your brain, it looks like chaos, just spikes all over the place. It's sort of like if you were to walk into the, into the auditorium right before, right after service and everybody's talking, everybody's fellowshipping, but there isn't coordination of the fellowship. You hear some sounds, but it sounds just like noise. That's what happens if you put electrodes on the brain. You listen while you're awake because every part of your brain is doing its own thing. It's just spiky noise. There's some, some patterns to it, but, but overall, just lots of independent work. You fall asleep and you go into these non-REM stages. And what happens is your brain, it's, it's more like when we all together set our hearts on the same truth and we sing. Right, we, we all are singing the same words. Now, all of our conversation is coordinated. Our purposes are unified. And our voices combine to, rather than the, the background noise of everybody doing their own thing, we, with one purpose, sing. And that's what happens when you listen, when you put the electrodes on during non-REM. You get this coordination of spikes. Your brain is doing its maintenance jobs. It's taken the data from the day, all that you learned, organizing, compressing, deciding what do I need to keep? What do I need to get rid of? And data transfer. It's, it's pretty, pretty remarkable that during the, those non-REM, especially deep stages, the, what's going on with the, what you learned throughout the day. You sacrifice non-REM, especially deep sleep, which tends to be heavy in those early four to six hours of sleep, especially the first two to three. That's when your deep sleep is really front-loaded. If you miss that, you will have consequences for your memory. If you use that, your memory will be better. So to stay up late to cram for a test is like the epitome of foolishness, because you're actually going to be missing the part of your sleep where those memories are taken from like your RAM, your, your use of the day and offloaded to your long-term storage. And your brain, as it does that, doesn't just mindlessly save, it processes those and saves the important stuff. And so if, don't miss the front. And you can't like go to bed at midnight. If you're used to going to bed at nine, you can't go to bed at midnight and sleep three extra hours and get all those benefits because you're going to jump straight into the later stages, which is REM heavy, which is taking that data that you learned, the data that you offloaded, and now processing it. It's that REM stage where um, if you put, hook up electrodes to rats who've been spending all day learning to go through mazes, they'll actually at like half speed or quarter speed, you'll see the same spikes that they had as they were learning the maze. They're relearning. They're figuring it out. They're taking the data and they're processing it. You do the same thing with what you learned during the day during REM. You are taking the experiences, all the data that you just spent the first half of the night processing, offloading, contemplating, and now you're creatively applying it. That's why sometimes you wake up in the morning and have the answer to the problem that you couldn't figure out that you spent all night the night before thinking about. It's why pianists these studies have been done if you learn to like type a um, type a pattern on a keyboard really fast you'll get better with practice after a night's sleep you will have the best result if there's a if you're a pianist or a musician and you're working on a piece and you're practicing 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 then you go to sleep you'll play it better in the morning if you get a full night's sleep because during REM you practice that that's why during REM if you look at somebody, it's like they're paralyzed. Their motor cortex is going nuts. The part of their brain that processes movements is going nuts, learning the things that it learned during the day. But there's a disconnect, a switch that disconnects the motor cortex from your muscles so that your brain's practicing all the, all the things. If you play a sport, do, learn a jump shot, musician, all, it's crazy. You're, you're, pro, you're practicing all night long, or at least during the second half of the night, during those stages of REM. You're practicing what you learned. 
but your brain disconnected it from your arms and your legs so you don't move. That's why you look paralyzed. What an amazing thing that God did. And this is not to speak of, I, I spoke about the glymphatic system last time, that in, especially during deep sleep, your brain shrinks in size and power washes the proteins and the waste products away. And if you don't do that, those build up and they're correlated heavily with dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss. And we could go on. I, I'm not going to, but I, I just want that to be a glimpse of some of just the amazing things that happen while you're asleep that's not just being unconscious. God did this. Why would we neglect this gift? And he did it as a gift. So Christian, you not only get to reflect on, or you don't only get to receive this gift of God by expressing faith in him and receiving it as a sweet gift, but just when you wake up, now that you know a little bit about what God designed your body to do while you were unconscious, just give him thanks. Why would we purposefully neglect this gift? In summary, and then we'll get off of the physiology thing, sleep scientist Matthew Walker writes an evidence-based summary of sleep. He says, routine, routine, of what happens when you lack sleep. He says, routinely sleeping less than six hours a night weakens your immune system, substantially increases your risks of certain forms of cancer, and insufficient sleep appears to be a key lifestyle factor linked to your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Inadequate sleep, even moderate reductions for just one week, disrupt blood sugar so profoundly that you would be classified as a pre-diabetic. Short sleeping increases the likelihood of your coronary arteries becoming block, blocked and brittle, and the shorter you sleep, the shorter your lifespan. The physical and mental impairments caused by one night, sleep of bad, one night of bad sleep dwarf those caused by an equivalent absence of food and exercise. And yet it's so easy to think that we know better to rise early and stay up late, neglecting this good gift as a chronic way of life. Our need for sleep must not be a point of frustration, some, something we're dissatisfied in, viewed as a necessary evil. No, sleep is a good gift from a gracious God, and he uses it for our good while teaching us to embrace the humbling reality that we are dependent creatures. Now, I don't want, now, please don't take this important lesson to neglect sleep or not to neglect sleep as a license to pursue sleep as much as you can. Just as like with so many good gifts like food, physical intimacy and marriage, money and power, sleep is prone to abuse. It is possible to receive a good gift and forget its giver. That's idolatry. It's also possible to be lazy and gluttonous in our enjoyment of sleep. Just because a gift is good and from the Lord does not mean that you should pursue as much of that thing as possible. Unrestrained enjoyment of food is sinful gluttony and unrestrained sleep, especially in neglect of what ought to be done, is foolish, sluggardly laziness. Don't underestimate indwelling sin ability to twist you into neglecting, abusing, or otherwise seeking to ruin God's best gifts, especially sleep. We have a multitude of warning and warnings in Proverbs about this. We're going to open with these ways of neglecting sleep, how sleep next week, sleep can be an effect of, it can show laziness. Sleep can be spiritual inattentiveness and other ways that you can sin in sleep. And then we're going to get into some, some practical stuff. But I don't want to close today without leaving you with Solomon's warnings. Consider the descriptions of the foolish, lazy sluggard who has no fear of God in his heart, who does not seek wisdom. Proverbs 6, 9 through 11. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Proverbs 10.5, he who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Proverbs 19.5, slothfulness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. 
Proverbs 20, 13, love not sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. For the drunkard and the glutton, Proverbs 23, 21, will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. In Proverbs 26, 14, as a door turns, so does a sluggard in his bed. Christians who fear God ought to work and ought to work diligently. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, and a slack hand causes poverty, and the hand of the diligent makes rich. If you don't have a house because you didn't build one, if you're poor because you didn't work, and if your stuff got stolen because you didn't take appropriate precautions, I said this last time, don't blame God. Sleep is not an excuse for laziness. Sleep is a sweet gift of God, a chance to rest from your work, from what God has given you to do. We have work to do. The Christian's life ought to be marked by hard work while we're awake and sweet rest while we sleep. Speaking to Christian slaves, Paul writes in Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving Christ. And then generally to all Christians in Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Psalm 127 is not an encouragement to idleness or laziness, but an encouragement to trust God and a sweet reminder that while we work diligently, we are working as if unto the Lord. And when we work, when God's own work diligently for him and we look back at what we accomplish, we see that it was ultimately God working behind the scenes to make our work eternally valuable something that will survive the refining fire of judgment and redound to his glory for eternity. We'll find that as we obey, it's God who works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Only the Christian can have the Lord build a house when he builds or establish his family. Only a Christian can have confidence that as they keep watch, it is the Lord doing the watching. So don't be lazy. And I'll close by stealing John Piper's words. Again, I do that a lot. So don't eat the bread of anxious toil. Because no matter how hard you work to achieve anything, God has lifted off your back the final responsibility for its success. And God can accomplish more good for those who trust him while they sleep than they can accomplish with anxious labor while awake. He gives sleep to his beloved. You're dismissed.